Well, everyone, hello. It's uh, 12.01, and I want to be uh, sensitive to everyone's time and make sure that we have an opportunity for uh, productive dialogue. So I'm sure we'll keep hearing some binging and uh, some other dinging going on, but I'm going to get started. My name is Lucas Rickert. Uh, I'm the George Erdang Chair in the History of Pharmacy in uh, the UW-Madison School of Pharmacy. And I'm also the historical director of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. So please bear in mind that uh, this meeting is being recorded and it's going to be available to others in the future. Um, we would ask you politely uh, to keep yourself muted uh, and um, perhaps even keeping your video off during the presentation. So during the Q&A portion, uh, of this, you can use uh, the chat feature to ask a question, or you can raise your hand, uh, and then you can just unmute yourself uh, after called upon to just ask um, Dr. Kempner a question. So this talk and uh, others in uh, our psychedelic speakers series would not be possible without the valuable support of uh, partners. Uh, and so I want to thank the UW Transdisciplinary Center for Research in Psychoactive Substances, which was established um, just last year. Its mission is to support research and educational activities regarding psychedelic drugs and related compounds. This talk is also brought to you by the Robert F. and Jean E. Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies, and this center has a mission to promote broad interdisciplinary understanding of science, technology, and medicine as human enterprises. And thirdly, I want to thank the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. And its goal, its aim is to advance knowledge and understanding of the history of pharmacy and medicines. I very much encourage you to explore the AIHP, the Holt Center, and the UW Transdisciplinary Center, uh, and to poke around a little bit, uh, familiarize yourself with these units. Um, we're trying to do uh, some good work to uh, expand understanding of uh, different novel psychoactive substances. If you have scope to be involved, um, either volunteering some time, uh, that'd be lovely if you have scope to uh, donate some uh, financial resources for uh, educational activities such as this in the future, that would also be fantastic. With that in mind, let me introduce you to our, um, our guest speaker today. Dr. Joanna Kempner is an Associate Professor of Sociology at Rutgers University. Uh, she writes, researches, and teaches at the intersection of science, medicine, and inequality. Uh, and there has been an explicit focus on the politics of pain and treatment in her work. Her award-winning book, Not Tonight, Migraine and the Politics of Gender and Health, examines the social values embedded in how we talk about, understand, and make policies for people in pain. The reason she's here today is she's currently writing a second book, which is tentatively called Psychedelic Outlaws. It's under contract with Hatchet Book Group, and it's about patient-led research in the underground and its role in the psychedelic uh, renaissance. I'll just say lastly, you can read about her work on her website, which is joannakempner.com, and you can also follow her on uh, Twitter, and that is at Joanna Kempner. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thanks so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. I'm, of course, in the wrong. I was always in the wrong control of Zoom, <laughs> always in the wrong window. Um, and now, again, I'm in the wrong window. There we go because I haven't used Zoom long enough these last few years. It's always, always, I'll never be an expert, um, which is fine. Um, thank you guys so much for this invitation. I'm really excited to be here talking about this project. I'm also um, unreasonably nervous seeing who's here. Um, there's some um, 
people I haven't seen for a long time and also some people whose work I just truly admire. Um, I uh, am here talking uh, about a paper called Standards Without Labs, Drug Development in the Psychedelic Underground. It's a piece of a larger project that I'm working on and have been working on um, for a long time. But this particular paper, I've been working on uh, with John Bailey. Uh, he was here um, today. Maybe he can just pop in and say hello. <laughs> John is... Um, uh, just about to finish his dissertation in sociology at Rutgers. And uh, we've already written one paper about this. It's in social science and medicine about collective self-experimentation. And he's been uh, amazing helping me analyze all of this data. And so a lot of the analysis that you are going to hear today about standardization and standards comes straight from the brain of John. Um, so uh, he will be here for Q and A as well. And um, yeah. So I never, uh, I, it's unusual for ethnographers to, to, co to collaborate. Um, so thanks, John. <laughs> of course, it's a um, but I also want to say um, a few things, uh, a few other things before I begin. Um, as a science studies scholar, um, I resist Whiggish stories about individuals creating science. Um, in this case, I'm clearly not the only person responsible for today's talk. Um, this is a collaborative project all around. Um, this is a project about people creating knowledge in a really collaborative way. And a number of the people who are created the psychedelic knowledge I'm about to talk to about um, are actually in the audience, I believe. So if um, I'm going to be talking about people who created psychedelic knowledge in the underground. And so if anybody is here who is, was part of that group um, and want to just jump on and say hi, That'd be awesome. Um, who wants to actually say that they're here? I think uh, I think there's some cluster busters here. I think Bob's here. Hello. <laughs> I'm here. Hi, Bob. Bob. Bob's in the talk. His picture's on the talk. So um, Bob can be can uh, answer questions too. Bob is the um, founder um, and executive director of Cluster Busters. Um, so uh, he'll be here and he can talk a lot about this process as well. So thank you. Um, okay, so I can get started. I'm gonna start with one of the people I interviewed in this project, his name um, is, I'm calling him Paul. Uh, Paul is uh, active in Cluster Busters, um, but he doesn't want to use his real name. Um, he is a professional who works in the healthcare sector. Um, so given the nature of the medicine he uses, um, that's why I use an alias. Uh, so he began um, in our interview by explaining what it means to have cluster headache. Um, cluster headache may not be a disease all of you are familiar with, um, and the term headache doesn't really provide sufficient weight to the problem um, that people with cluster headache are experiencing. Uh, this is a illustration, it's one of the most powerful paintings. You can actually see this painting being drawn on YouTube as a video, and um, if you're interested, I, I can uh, you can find the video online, I, I, I recommend it. Um, let me just uh, give you a quick description of cluster headache. So it's, um, it's, it's a rare disease, but it's, it's not that rare. It's about as common as multiple sclerosis. Um, and people who have cluster headache describe it as a pain of unimaginable intensity. It comes on very quickly, first as a pressure building on, uh, on one side of the head, and then very, very quickly, it feels like a hot iron blade plunging deep into the eye. Then next, um, kind of like in sympathy, the offending side of the face droops, the eyelid swells, and the eye and the nose release a waterfall of tears and snot. The body responds with a restless urgency. People pace, they bang their head, uh, they become very physically agitated. Um, and the way it's been described to me is like when you bang your thumb in a, a car door and you just have to shake because it hurts so bad. And people are also often trying to knock themselves unconscious because the pain is so extraordinary. Uh, people who have been shot, have experienced gunshots, people who've experienced uh, unanesthetized um, amputations, people who've experienced unmedicated labor, uh, all say that a cluster headache attack is uh, exponentially worse. And when you have a cluster attack, it lasts about 15 to 90 minutes, uh, and then it stops, but you may have them um, up to up to eight a day. Um, 
They come uh, in clusters, that's where the name comes from, and they can last for a few weeks uh, to a few months. Those are the episodic cluster headaches, but then there are people who have chronic cluster headache and they do not go into a remission. Uh, people with cluster headache uh, very often experience suicidal ideation within uh, while having attacks and then um, post uh, PTSD uh, for fear of having attack. Each attack is essentially an emergency, uh, but there is uh, very, very little um, research in this area. So Paul was not getting very good medical treatment. Um, many people with cluster headache don't get diagnosed. Um, it takes about five years on average to get a diagnosis. Uh, and this was many years ago when this when he was experiencing this kind of <laughs> lengthy time having cluster headache. And so um, he went to online as many of us do when we have um, medical problems and he typed in cluster headache treatment. If you look at the algorithm, you will see pretty quickly that there you will find cluster headache treatment um, at home. So when you find that, um, if, you, <laughs> if your algorithm is good, you may come across uh, something called the cluster buster method. Uh, cluster buster method is a psychedelic method developed underground. So um, he gave it a shot. And he talked to me a little bit about what this shot looked like. So Paul said he was scientifically minded um, and he had never done psychedelics before. So he read a lot about this. He read a lot about the science behind it. He was really nervous, um, but he decided that he would follow this really um, carefully. So <clears throat> first he had to get his own mushrooms. He, got, he knew from this protocol how to obtain his own spores, grow the right strain, um, and measure them and grind them up into pills. Um, and once he took one little dose, um, he, and then he would wait until he see if he felt something, he would take a little bit more until he described um, feeling, knowing that he had eaten enough when psychedelic patterns swirled beneath his closed eyes. It was a feeling he said he was relieved to discover it was, quote, damn pleasant. Um, <clears throat> sorry. When I asked him whether or not his experiment with mushrooms worked, he described psilocybin as a miracle, and he backed up his claim with a diary detailing his remarkable remission from cluster headaches. So this isn't actually his diary. Uh, I interviewed him on the phone, but this is a very a diary that somebody in a cluster busters meeting had showed me, um, and it was like a kind of detailed scale that they had developed. Um, now, Paul is far from the only person for whom this protocol found online has worked, um, and you, some of you may have read about how people with cluster headache are finding the psilocybin uh, protocol uh, effective. This protocol is in clinical trial. The clinical trial is wrapping up. The initial findings should be published soon. Um, what is I find really re remarkable about this clinical trial is that the clinical trial, uh, the investigator in the clinical trial used as her initial protocol, the protocol that she is testing now, to, was taken directly um, from Cluster Busters protocol. So Emmanuel Schindler, who was running that trial, says, and this is from a, um, uh, a Washington Post article, she's repeated the same thing to me, um, and, and she talks about this multiple times, she's very transparent about this. She says, Eman Emmanuel Schindler not only relied on cluster busters to recruit patients for her study, but also used key parts of their dosing protocol. After years of self-experiments, many group members believe they have shortened or busted their clusters with three sub-hallucinogenic amounts of mushrooms spaced five days apart. So she's using synthetic psilocybin on a similar schedule. Um, and she says she expects to show that patients know a lot more about their condition and how to treat it than they're usually given credit for. So somehow this protocol designed underground, a standardized protocol was, was good enough that Schindler was able to translate it, stick it into uh, an FDA approved clinical trial at Yale, which we will see results from soon, right? So what um, John Bailey and I wanted to know was how did a group of citizen science uh, create a standardized protocol for the treatment of cluster headache from fun fungi, right? So this is a fungus that they grew in their homes and how did they do it in record time? And just to preview the answer, 
they did because they did this without a chemical. <laughs> they didn't have a laboratory. They did it with embodied knowledge, and they did it because they had to. They didn't have a choice. So um, that's the answer that we'll come to um, in just a moment. I always find it so weird to uh, just talk to everybody without seeing anybody. So just give me a minute, because I want to see if I can see you. Like, I, are, like, are you even there? I never know. OK. All right, so um, just a little brief overview about standards in medical knowledge, and then um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the, how the cluster busters came about and where I'm getting all of this information about how they developed their protocol. And then I'll talk about how they developed, you know, what, what was actually going on in the underground and, and what we found. Okay, so um, standards generally, there's a really great literature on what standards are and how standards are used in medical knowledge and why we need them. Um, Stefan Timmermans and Steve Epstein, um, right, particularly Stefan Timmermans, writes, uh, have written about uh, standardization. They talk about standards about a as a process of constructing uniformities across time and space through the generation of agreed upon rules. Now, standardization means different things in different times and places in medicine. When people in medicine are making medical knowledge, standards are really strict, right? And cluster busters was making medical knowledge. Uh, but this, this strictness in making medical knowledge doesn't really become super strict until 1962, when the Kefauver harris Amendment of the FDA um, is passed by Congress. And, um, and legislates that uh, clinical trials have to uh, be based on adequate and well-controlled investigations. And this leads to the codification of randomized controlled trials as the gold standard for knowledge, uh, the things that we know about safe and effective medications. It also legislates essentially um, or leads to the, to, to the kind of governance of FDA's IND applications where pharmaceutical companies uh, now have to issue or, or clinical people, researchers in clinical trials have to have used these kind of IN, uh, drugs that are made uh, by pharmaceutical companies and IND applications have to be filed. Now, this means that and, and, and commentators realize this almost right away, um, that new drugs can really only be made by the most well-resourced form, re, excuse me, well-resourced firms pushing new drugs to the market. Um, and this is ascendancy is going to create a, a lot of undone science. It's gonna make things a lot harder for people who don't have a lot of resources. And it's certainly gonna make things a lot harder for people like you know, regular, you know, un people with cluster headache, right? They're not, they're not going to have access to this kind of, uh, this kind of medication. But there's also the, a different kind of standard of medical knowledge. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I had another point. Um, we, we, we assign a lot of ep epistemic authority associated with this technologically sophisticated objective measurable standard. But there's also this other standard in medical care. It's more pragmatic. It's the kind of standard that we use when we're just treating, when doctors are treating patients. It's more pragmatic. Doctors are more interested. You know, they, they, they like to have pills that are standardized. Um, so they know it, you know, you, you want to know what you're taking when you're taking medicine. But a lot of clinical care is based more on art um, than, than necessarily evidence, right? There's a lot of off-label use of drugs. Uh, doctors have a sense about what they think works. Um, and the reliance on standards in medical practice depends a lot more on context. So um, making medical knowledge, there's a lot of, everything's really strict, but you know, when you're just trying to get people better, standards get loosened a little bit. So I just wanna kind of keep that in mind a little bit when we look at what cluster busters are actually doing. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about the cluster buster story. So, <clears throat> The cluster buster story starts in 1998. There's a man named Craig Adams. He goes by Flash. He goes by Flash like just in regular everyday life. Um, <clears throat> sometimes in the literature, he's called patient zero. 
And in July 1998, right around the time that there's a first internet forum about cluster headache, he posts uh, on this cluster headache forum um, that he is able to use an LSD-like substance to stop his cluster headache attacks from coming. Uh, it takes a little while for other people with cluster headache to try it too, um, but enthusiasm begins to grow in cluster headache forums um, between usually around between the years 2000 and 2002. Um, Bob Wold, who is I think still online, um, <clears throat> around 2002 begins to realize that this conversation can't continue on a broad public forum. There are enough people who are experimenting online with um, mushrooms and all kinds of different psychedelics really at that time that there needs to be a kind of dedicated space for people to experiment with psychedelics and to really kind of drill down and figure out how to use these drugs. So he founds an organization called Cluster Busters. The organization at that point is really just a private email group dedicated to developing psychedelic medicine for cluster headache. And during this time, the group itself is also reaching out to academics. They're reaching out to Rick Doblin as well. And they're reaching out to university researchers to see if they can also get some authorized research done to help them with this work. But they don't want to wait. They can't wait because people with cluster headache aren't just thinking about suicide. Some of them are actually attempting suicide. Um, and so they need to also do this for pragmatic reasons. Uh, so the research that I'm about to present to you mostly comes from those internet forums, but um, since 2013, really, I have been going to Cluster Buster events. They have annual meetings. I've been talking to people in the Cluster Busters meetings. I've been interviewing people who were around back uh, 20 years ago doing this work. Um, and I have also have access to archived email exchanges between Cluster Buster leadership, academics, and activists from uh, that time. So a lot of the data here, which I'll show you just a summary, a very short summary of, uh, comes from an analysis of all of those things. So in this little portion of um, the data where I show you how the standardized protocol is produced, um, what I want, the email I'm about to show you, and this is Bob Wold here, this, is, this comes from his very first email to that private group where he decides that he really wants to drill down and come up with a protocol for using psilocybin. And his first message out starts, hello, fellow cluster heads and keepers of the flame. And he has selected a few people from this big, broad public group who seem really serious about developing psychedelics. And they have a kind of back and forth. And one of the first emails, he says, he says, I think an important place to start is to get going on setting up an FAQ for the group in treatment. And he sets up a link to something that he had done a few years prior to for a migraine group he was in, thinking it would be something similar, right? Like, you know, kind of an awareness website. Let's set up an aware, you know, hey, in case anybody with cluster headache wants to use this, we should have a website showing people how to use this. He called himself Pink based on Pink Floyd. Um, I think he liked Pink Floyd before he did psychedelics. He can clarify that later. So almost immediately, somebody writes back with some questions for this FAQ. And I wanted to list these because I think that by doing so, you can see that in presenting an FAQ, what Bob Wold was doing was actually much, I think, he, I think sometimes we get into projects not knowing how hard they are. And I think maybe he was doing that here. Uh, so the FAQ is actually a really, really difficult drug protocol. And you'll see that in the, in the set of FAQs that are initially um, suggested. So somebody writes back and says, some of the questions I hear often, how do I obtain mushrooms? Will my meds interact with psilocybin? Do I need to detox from my meds for mushroom therapy? Will my mushroom therapy help chronic cluster sufferers as well as episodics? How much psilocybin do I need to take in order to treat my cluster headaches? How often will I need to dose? And then this person follows up. Obviously, these questions are going to require some pretty in-depth responses. For a number of these questions, we are currently only able to give partial answers. We have to really think through our responses and write several drafts. So this person here suddenly realizes 
these are actually questions they don't have answers to. This is more than just compiling information and creating awareness, they're gonna actually have to produce knowledge. And only some of these problems um, can be controlled and developed with objective standards because they don't have a laboratory. Everything else, as I'm going to describe in my next, the last 10 minutes I have really, is going to depend on embodied standards. One of the biggest problems is they don't have psilocybin. <laughs> they just don't. They don't even really have magic mushrooms. So they have to figure out how to get their medicine. They already know that, they, they've already decided they, they can't just borrow it from people. They're, most of them don't, aren't in college anymore. They don't know dealers. Um, and most of them are afraid to forage because they're afraid that they're, they don't know what they're gonna get. They're worried they're gonna collect the wrong thing. So they pretty quickly decide that cultivation is going to be their answer. Um, cultivation allows them some quality and safety control. Uh, psilocybin scores can be purchased legally online in all but two states. The cultivating those spores into mushrooms is illegal. That means the consumer has some control over the species they buy and the strain of fungus that they buy. That means cultivation improves safety of drug supply, but variations in dosage remain. Now, these variations matter a lot. Mushrooms vary in size, shape, weight, and potency. So you can see, I mean, I would say, first of all, that 50% maybe of this conversation that happens in this group is just people trying to figure out how to grow these mushrooms um, and then figuring out like what's in these mushrooms. So just one quote, I've noticed a potency variance from flush to flush, let alone batch, batch to batch. So, I mean, you know, what is, people are confused about like, well, what is a mushroom? I mean, is this contamination? Is a stem more potent than a, a, a cap? I mean, there's a lot going on here, just trying to figure out once you have the mushroom how do you turn the mushroom into medicine? And it's really important for people to understand the potency of each of their doses. But the potency of each mushroom and each part of each mushroom varies. So this is just a quote illustrating what happens if you get your dose wrong. Now, keep in mind the people in this group are the people who have been doing taking these doses for a long time. They're, they're pretty experienced with taking psychedelics at this point. So here's somebody saying, I took another one and a half grams of cubensis today at 1230. Wow, much stronger than the last time. At the peak, I had the sensation of my body being painlessly twisted apart, like geometrical silly putty. I felt my skull fold out into or origami like configurations. So I started playing the flute. So not everybody uh, who stumbles upon um, a website is going to be ready for their skull to turn into origami, right? And so um, people are going to, for a variety of reasons, going to want to know how much uh, of their mushroom is going to be psilocybin and how their body may react to that. They have a couple of strategies for standardizing their dose. Remember, they, so they don't have the chemical psilocybin um, and they only have the things that really are in their kitchen or that they can obtain. So mechanical objectivity um, so the, the strategies that involve the chemical objectivity are limited. Uh, they, can, they can dry out their mushrooms till they're crocker dry. They can weigh them. They can make sure they're storing their uh, mushrooms um, in, in a way that they don't lose potency. Uh, they can grind and, and mix up their mushrooms so that the caps and stems are all like mixed up together. And then uh, divide things into half gram capsules. That's one thing they do. But mostly what they do is they really engage in, in their body in, into an embodied standard. And this they're taking from the broader psychedelic underground. And many of you, if you're, if you're familiar with, the psychedel with psychedelics, you know that this is actually something that is used in randomized controlled trials as well. Um, and uh, this idea of trip levels. Um, so they have to gauge from a mushroom, which is not the drug, how much their body and, and, and how much they're actually getting of psilocybin. So they aim for something with they, with, that they call the buzz of like a beer. Um, and they talk about it as a trip level one or two, somewhere between a trip level one or two, and they talk about a, a beer buzz. And you can see in the protocol how they talk about this. Don't, don't let levels three, four, and five, which are the more intense psychedelic experiences, scare you. We aren't trying to get there. Consider the differences between going out and having a beer or two and deciding to have a case of beer to wash down a dozen shots of tequila. 
So that's how they kind of manage how much each dose is. There are lots of other kinds of situation, things that might affect how much of a dose they get, how sensitive an individual is, but also how many medications they are on. Because if you, are take, if you have cluster headache, you're probably taking a lot of medications just to manage your disease. And many of those medications are actually ergot derivatives or serotonin agonists. Um, so particularly back, we're talking 2002 to 2005 right now, a lot of the medications people would be on would be dihydroergotamine. This is a chemical that was actually synthesized by Albert Hoffman, the same person who synthes originally synthesized LSD. Sumatriptan, that's a same intellectual tradition uh, from LSD. Um, but they're also taking things like prednisone, lithium. Um, oh, sorry, that's a, that's a double, sorry. Um, they don't know, they don't have all of the information that a scientist would have to figure out drug interactions. So in order to figure these things out, they have to kind of feel, they kind of have to feel like what, it's a psychedelic, am I having the psychedelic experience that I thought I might have? So here's just an example of what that sounds like. Um, dosed with four grams of tea. Now that would be, that should cause a high trip. I decided to lower the last six gram dose, which would really be a strong trip, and try a dark room alone with only music, which should also, you know, heighten the trip. I still cannot get past level one. What I need is some suggestions on why I cannot get to a level two and what I can do about it. So in response, somebody says, all I can suggest is that maybe the fentanyl patch is still having some effect. I know a little about fentanyl, it's not available here, but Mopar was on methadone when he first tried the shrooms and noticed a little effect from the shrooms then. So in absence of the kind of ex expertise and kind of knowledge that maybe a, 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 an authorized or an expert scientist might have, they kind of just have to feel through some of what these drug interactions might be. And then they have to come up with really pragmatic solutions to the problem of detoxing. Some people have found it impossible to stay away from their abortive meds, and that will pretty much stop this from working. If a dose, um, if, it, if you can't do it, they say, um, maybe you can eliminate imatrix, that's the sumatriptan, by making a batch of tea, they're talking about psilocybin tea, and keeping it in the fridge. And then they talk about taking sips and dose, um, you know, maybe basically what they're saying is microdosing and trying to get off some of your abortive meds because going off of your abortive meds when you're having these cluster attacks is just so incredibly difficult. So they're going, through, they're using trial and error um, and trying to kind of feel their way through this process. Um, and then just kind of skip a lot of their process because I mean, there are so many things they have to feel their way through and use these kind of embodied standards for. Uh, it really only takes about a little over a year before Bob Wold finally says that he sort of thinks they have a dosing protocol now. He says, without adding up all the latest case studies, I don't think there's been any change in the theory that best results will be attained by the greatest percentage of people by following the basic guidelines. And the protocol ends up being around one and a half to two grams of dried mushroom uh, taken three times about five days apart. It takes a lot of work for them to figure out this dosing schedule. They basically do a dose ranging study that you would do in a phase two clinical trial. And it includes an enormous amount of hypothesis formation, iterative testing and collective self-experimentation. Um, they have to work out an enormous amount of science all through this process of sort of feeling things out and being eminently flexible. And in addition to that, they have variations of this protocol for people who have chronic cluster headache, people who are trying to prevent episodes, and people who are aborting episodes. Where it becomes a little trouble, a little bit more challenging is reporting the efficacy of their uh, protocol in a systemic fashion, because net by now they are working with researchers at Harvard. They had for all this time, they have been, uh, I, think, I think probably since the year 2001, they had had a survey that Arrowhead was hosting for them uh, to help them collect data on whether or not this was working. But by probably about 2003, 2004, um, maybe 2004, uh, Harvard was using that survey to collect data. And um, when you use the survey, you know, they're 
are these closed, you know, you have really have to have an answer. Like there were the, the, the they had to, people had to operationalize the results. Um, and they, and the researchers they were working with at Harvard really wanted specific answers. And I could see, and maybe <laughs> I've never asked Bob Old about this, I don't think specifically, but you can all, we, John and I kept seeing in the data that Bob would keep going back and, and, and trying to figure out why people weren't answering the questions the way that they should have been answered. And sometimes he would say things like, this is very important in all caps. Why have some of you not filled out the database form? And he, he would say things like, this is our best chance of getting government approval. You got, why aren't you saying whether or not this works or not works? Why aren't you saying um, you know, what symptoms were relieved or not relieved? And what we saw in the data was that some of those embodied standards were really difficult to put into concrete forms. And we, there was one particular quote that we thought really captured the ambiguity and vagueness of an embodied standard and how it could sometimes be difficult to articulate that standard in a way that a scientist might like. Um, this was the one that we loved the most. Somebody talks about their dosing strategy. When a particularly hard shadow had come along in the evening, I would sip about one and a half ounces of tea scientifically measured by pouring the tea into a Looney Tunes juice glass up to the level of the bottom of Wiley E. Coyote's foot. I would take a tiny sip and swish it around my mouth for a minute before swallowing, then repeat until the Wiley glass was empty. So you could see really a resistance. Uh, I don't think anybody could articulate exactly what, it, what the, where that resistance was, but the resistance was because the embodiment was working for them, that that kind of that having a little bit of flexibility worked for people in a way that that kind of hardcore scientific um, standard didn't wouldn't work as quite as well for people. So um, to kind of pull this all together, the embodied standards in the underground, uh, they were necessary. They were necessary in the absence of the kind of technologies that people have in laboratories, and they were also necessary for people's survival. But they also worked. I know they work because Emmanuel, Dr. Emanuel Schindler was able to import that dosing protocol directly into her clinical trial. Now, will she find that they're effective in that phase two trial? I don't know. Well, I guess we'll find out soon. Um, but we know that, or at least they seem to work in, her, in medication use surveys, um, which are finding that psilocybin is the at least by patient reports, the most effective medication that is available for cluster headaches. Um, we think that they work reading through all of these forums because those standards are endlessly flexible and they're incredibly pragmatic. They're the kind of standards that you use in, in clinical encounters. Um, I have just two things I wanted to end on. The first one is something that that patient zero flash said about this. Um, he says that, when you're working on, on in this underground, when you use, your, you use yourself as a laboratory, when you use yourself as your own lab, you get far more insight into what's happening. Like the doctor can only go by what the patient tells them or what the blood test tells them or whatever. You don't really know what it feels like inside, but it feels like, it's like you've got a really sensitive instrument there telling you how well it's working. And then just one last thought, this comes from uh, Dr. Andrew Sewell, who was one of those Harvard uh, scientists who went to Yale, Dr. Schindler's mentor, um, talking about unauthorized research in cluster headache. And he just says, it was not a cadre of smart Ivy League doctors drawing chemical diagrams on chalkboards or, or the shamans. Um, he says, unauthorized research made the discovery, leaving authorized research merely to confirm it and refine it. So um, I will leave it there. I probably took too much time, but I'm excited for your questions. Um, and that's that. Okay. You did not take too much time. It was fantastic. Okay. Uh, um, and the floor is totally open for people to um, ask some questions. If you don't want to unmute yourself and you want to pop a question in the, the chat, that is also fine too. Hey Luke, can you hear me? Yes, definitely, please go Hi. ahead. This is Cody. 
Um, thank you so much for the talk. I uh, wonder if you could comment on broadly the, the idea of kind of harmonizing data across these two uh, collection approaches. Is that even something to consider? It, um, and if so, you know, what do you think are useful uh, strategies uh, given that we now, you know, have ongoing data collection kind of uh, on parallel tracks within the you know, scientific establishments and continuing in the underground? Um, that is a really good question. And I think it's a particularly good question given the regulatory concerns that are emerging um, around uh, decriminalization of psilocybin um, and uh, whether or not, given, given how people with pain are using psilocybin um, versus how people with, um, you know, mental health issues, um, a variety of mental health issues are using psilocybin. Um, so there seem to be kind of two different tracks here, right? There's, there's FDA working through this kind of, you know, the normal regulatory system. Uh, around how these drugs will be used. Um, and then there's this kind of underground information, not just with cluster headache, but with all kinds of other underground uses. Um, and I would love to see, I mean, I don't know that I have the answers, but I would love to see more work on how there could be regulatory oversight or how there can be oversight to help people use drugs like this in a really safe way without relying on experts, expert authority in the way that we're super accustomed to. So, you know, I mean, just to throw out random ideas, like wouldn't it be great if those state governments um, could help people find this information. Um, I mean, Cluster Busters does this really amazing job with mutual aid uh, and helps people take these medications as safely as they can, but it's a small organization and people have to obtain their own drugs, their own medications on their own. Um, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a state that also tried to protect people uh, and also tried to teach people, you know, I, I tried to make sure people were ingesting safe drugs and tried to, but, but didn't have to always be monitored by like expert therapists, which is not going to be a safe and accessible way for people in pain to take these drugs. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that there is actually going to be, this is going to come to a head very soon in state, in states where there is decrim decrim policies. Yeah, I think it was too big a question to be answered, but I really appreciate the, the thoughts and, and the insight. And I, I agree, I think um, sooner rather than later, <laughs> we're gonna have to grapple. Um, I know there, there, Luke, do you want to do the moderating or do you want me to do the moderating? Sure, I'll ask you a couple of questions from the chat. And then if anyone else wants to unmute themselves, um, and ask a question that you can do that too. Um, Eileen Brewer has asked you, Joanna, what do you think we can do with this knowledge? Uh, and is it possible for citizen science to be re uh, recommending protocols? Yeah, so um, uh, Eileen Brewer is actually the president of Cluster Busters um, and, uh, and is wonderful. So um, again, like I would love to see uh, some kinds of trust architectures put into place so that we know so that we know when to trust citizen science driven protocols. I often think it's you know over the last few years when we, as we because I also do this research in 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 other parts of my life around post truth post, you know, we live in this post-truth era where experts are diminished. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, and, and people are laughing at knowledge produced online, you know, people who think they're experts online. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm deeply embedded in a group of patients who very clearly know more than their doctors. Um, but we need some kind of way to sift through expertise that is different than the credentialing architecture that we have. The credentialing architecture we have is not good enough. There are many doctors who do not diagnose pain correctly for years while gaslighting their patients. And there are many patients who bring the correct medicine to their, to their fellow citizens. So, you know, I mean, I, that's what professions were supposed to do. That's what professions are supposed to do, but they are not doing that for a lot of people and, and in quite systematic ways. So I wish I had the correct answer for that, but I, I do think that's a huge gap um, in a kind of policy relevant field um, that I'd like to see filled. I'm gonna ask Paul's question uh, next, but first I just wanted to just take a little bit of a step back, Joanna, and ask you um, if you had any sort of interesting research stories that you wanted to share. I think that's a pretty varied audience here. I mean, you've done all these interviews over a long period of time. I know you've done the sort of embedded ethnographic work going to conferences. Uh, you've got these archival finds as well. Are there sort of intriguing stories that you wanted to share? Is there one that sticks out? Luke, I, you know, I have so many. <laughs> I just really have so many. <laughs> I don't even know which one I would pick. So I'm actually going to pass because I think there are a lot of questions. Fair enough. Paul uh, asks, have the Harvard or Yale groups obtained an opinion from the FDA regarding the likelihood that this empiric research would be acceptable in approving a cluster headache indication for psilocybin. Can I have um, uh, Bob Wold uh, comment on that? If Bob wants. Sure, I'm uh, happy to comment on this. Um, the, the real problem here between our research and what goes on in FDA approved clinical trials is, is this. And it was something that we learned really early on and that Craig Adams uh, was quoted on, on one of the earlier slides about our own bodies being the labs that we were working on. And um, we were really working with everybody on a one-on-one -on -one situation. And what everybody was able to do because they were reading their own reactions to whatever dose it was that they had taken was if, if they were going to end up taking three doses to treat their cluster cycle, they would take the first dose and then they would either report back to us or they would know enough themselves whether or not they had to adjust the dose. So if one gram wasn't enough to give them the results that they were looking for, based on a lot of different things, whether it was other medications that they were on or, you know, their own, um, you know, body makeup and, and, and that. For the second dose, they're able to make an adjustment. They could go up to a gram and a half or two grams. And if they got better results, then they would, re, you know, repeat that dose for dose three. That isn't what happens in either a doctor's office or in a clinical lab because the protocol is already set up and these people are going to get three doses at one and a half grams of dried mushrooms, the equivalent in psilocybin, and then see how the results are at the end. Um, but almost everyone that does this for the last 20 some years have been able to read their own body's reaction and exactly how they feel um, and make adjustments. And I don't know if that would ever be allowed or if there was some way of building that into an FDA approved clinical study. Um, so that, that is a huge issue with um, 
trying to get the FDA to approve a, uh, a good and workable system that's going to give the most people the, the most benefit and get the best results from it. Um, you know, if um, even when we were talking about, you know, this is the protocol that's going to give the most people the, the best bet of beating their cluster cycle. If they take a standardized dose, I mean, that might be 50% of the people will have great results. But if they can change their uh, dosing schedule or the amount that they're taking, um, you know, odds are probably 80 or 90% of the people are going to have success. And that's going to be really difficult to duplicate that sort of thing in a clinical study the way they're set up right now. So I, I had a, uh, recently also had a conversation um, with Dr. Schindler about this, who, when I, I, was, I was trying to ask her, go through some of these processes and say like, what would this look like in a clinical trial? And she was just like, a pharmaceutical company would have to take, it would take a hundred years and a billion dollars to do this because you cannot just change your dosage like this. You cannot, the, the, the inherent flexibility um, in all of this is, is just not, it's not doable. Um, I, I was sitting in there actually earlier today trying to figure out like what kind of experimental process is this? Uh, and we don't have anything. I don't, I mean, if somebody has an idea of what that looks like. Um, the best, I, the thing that I, I came, John and I had, I had came up with in social science and medicine was a kind of self-experimentation, but collective. Uh, where everybody is 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 doing n equals one in a kind of completely shared embodied situation, so that the knowledge is con consistently building on each other. Um, uh, you know, so much of what we know about in medical knowledge is and is is based on n equals one studies, but this is like ramped up um, and co completely done all at once, but the FDA, the FDA isn't gonna, that, that's not credible. That, there's no epistemic authority to that knowledge. Um, do you want me to take another question, Luke? I think Silky Roth was going to ask her question. Hi, Joanna. Um, that was, was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, at the very end of the presentation, you spoke about embodied standards as necessary in the absence of technology. Um, and I was wondering whether you might even want to push that further and say embodied standards are actually better <laughs> from a feminist and intersectional perspective because they apply to people's experience much more than perhaps the standardized um, FDA protocols. Um, it's so great and, and to hear you say it. First of all, um, Dr. Roth was my, uh, I, I was her TA at Penn 20 years ago and I love seeing you. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, I learned so much from you um, and, now, and I still am. Um, so that is a wonderful, wonderful, just such a wonderful idea. Uh, so much of the reason why I got into this area is, is because professions and this notion of um, detached objective knowledge systemic, systematically does not serve marginalized bodies. Uh, my interest had always been, you know, women's and non-white bodies. What's interesting about cluster headache is that Cluster headache had always been thought of as like a, a very white male body. It, it isn't actually, um, but but again, you know, marginalized bodies come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and in this in this case, it hasn't it hasn't served them at, at, at all. Pain um, pain is always resisted objectivity, uh, and psychedelics resist objectivity as well. I think this is actually probably what got Timothy Leary in trouble from the, from, from the get-go. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that insight. I did think more about how to make that argument though. <laughs>
Great. Other questions, comments? Somebody's asking if pharmaceutical companies are developing this and the answer is yes. Um, and one of the concerns I think um, uh, that uh, Porto Sofia shares as well is um, when, uh, who gets, who will ultimately um, earn, uh, who will ultimately gain access? Like who, who, will be, who gets credit for, who gets credit who profits and who gets access. Um, we do need these drugs to uh, be developed that will cost a lot of money. Um, and it is very, very exciting when people pay attention to pain um, in a serious way. It's very exciting when people pay attention to cluster headaches. So I don't wanna diminish that at all. Um, but yeah, there is um, there's an investor um, for this medication um, and it'll be really exciting if it comes to market. Uh, and I hope when it does that everybody has access to it. Well, Joanna Kempner, thank you so much for uh, sharing your work with us today. Um, it's really important, interesting work. Um, thanks for everyone who is here as well. Um, I see a couple of comments in the chat. From Eileen, she says, maybe we do get the trial, get the FDA approval, and then people have access and can do whatever they want with dosage at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Amanda Pratt has said, um, Porto Sophia is a nonprofit psychedelic prior art library working to make psychedelic patent, the psychedelic patent landscape more ethical. Eileen is calling for a revolution. So um, if you want to join her, uh, she can just contact her right there on the text. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Joanna, thanks again. Uh, I want to thank you. I also want to thank um, our academic sponsors. That's um, the Transdisciplinary Center for Research in Psychoactive Substances. That's the Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies. And that's the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy. We have other talks coming up in the future. Um, our very next one is called um, Literary Theory on Acid. Uh, and uh, you can check out the website for that. Um, so thanks to all of you for your participation uh, and for taking the time to be here.